Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much once again for, um, for coming along to our, our, our launch. It's been a long time coming, but uh, I won't say too much because Lily is uh, going to look after you this evening and she's going to run uh, proceedings. So I'll hand over to Lily. She's been one of the mainstays of the project. She's driven a lot of the social media and been a great, uh, great assistant to me in getting the message out across uh, multiple platforms. So um, we're very grateful f to all the girls, but Lily's really done a lot in the social media, so she got roped into emceeing tonight. So Lily, away you go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of our documentary on the Battle of Fromel. Thank you all for coming to support us. In particular, we would like to thank the following people. Dr. Marjorie O'Neill, the member for Coogee. Dr. O'Neill has been a great support to us throughout the project, and we are delighted that she is able to join us this evening. Madame Anne Boleyn, the French Consulate General. Madame Boleyn has also given us wonderful support throughout the project and helped us forge closer ties with Condorcy Lycée and the French community both here and in Fromel. Thanks also to Dana Le Levy from Haut de France. Dana has organized multiple places for the students to visit for the trip to France. And while we did not quite get there, we really appreciated all your support. The representatives from the various RSL clubs who provided financial support. Without your generous support, we would not have been here this evening. In particular, we would like to thank Stuart Jameson for his energy in gathering the support of many clubs to join the project. Denise Krupp for her tireless efforts in spreading the word about our project across many channels. The project simply would not have happened without Denise. To the Shelley family. Back in 2018, Josie, Josie Shelley spoke to us about her grandfather, Herbert Nutsey Bolt. Josie's emotional account of Nazi's story was so moving and enlightening that it became the inspiration for our documentary. Josie, we are so grateful that you were able to join us tonight. To Steve Shelley, we cannot thank you enough for your support of the project. When we were struggling to be able to fully fund the project, you did not hesitate in stepping in and helping us out. To have you believe in what we were doing meant a lot to all of us and made us feel confident in the journey that was ahead of us. Lambus Inglesos, the man responsible for uncovering the missing diggers at Fromel. Your determination and dedication is an inspiration to us all. We've learnt so much from you. To Patrick Lindsay, the executive producer of the documentary. Patrick has been with us since 2018 when he had the idea to create a film that told the story of Fromel through the eyes of young women today. The documentary may not have turned out exactly as we all wanted, but we were very proud of what we have been able to achieve together. We've all learnt so much from working with you, and I'm sure the memories we've created with you will last a lifetime. Finally, to Mr. Burden, Mrs. McGahn, and Mrs. McDiamond, and the rest of the college leadership team. The girls and I would like to thank you for your continuous support in making the documentary. We are so grateful to you all for giving us the incredible opportunity by providing us with the means of learning history in such an exciting and inspirational way and most importantly, the means to share this knowledge with others. Could you please pause for a moment to respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional custodians of this land on which we are meeting.
I would now like to invite Kate O'Sullivan to lead us in prayer. God of love and liberty, we bring our thanks this day for the peace and security we enjoy, which was won for us through the courage and devotion of those who gave their lives in time of war. We pray that their labor and sacrifice may not be in vain, but that their spirit may live on in us and in, ge and in generations to come. That the liberty, truth and justice, which they sought to preserve, may be seen and known in the nations upon earth. This we pray in the name of the one who gave his life for the sake of the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Clarence, St. Francis, pray for us. Thank you, Kate. I would li now like to invite our college principal, Mrs. Carrie McDiamond, to come forward and say a few words. Well, good evening and welcome to all of you. It is certainly with great pleasure that I extend a warm welcome to you all here this evening as we launch our documentary, The, Diggers of, the Lost Diggers of Fromel. We have been privileged to collaborate with Patrick Lindsay in the creation of this documentary and to recognise the work of Lambus and Glazers, who was instrumental in bringing in the tragedy of these lost soldiers to light. We are honoured to have them both here with us this evening. Tonight, through this work, we acknowledge and aim to restore the dignity of the diggers who were buried in the mass grave at Fromel in 1916. Giving a voice to the families who lost so much and a voice that reflects the female perspective has been at the heart of this documentary. It has certainly been an honour to be part of this significant project and in the ongoing recognition of these forgotten soldiers. The girls who started this journey over three years ago are now in year 12, and this year they will pass on their work to our year nine cohort. As the girls pass on the legacy of their work, they pass on the legacy of service of the soldiers they researched. They pass on the importance of ensuring our youth keep the stories of the past alive, and that they reflect upon the sacrifices that were made by both the soldiers themselves and those they left behind. It is this notion of enduring remembrance that is so significant and why we as a college remain committed to this and other projects like it. We are proud that the young women of St Clair's have played a role in shining a light on the deeply moving personal stories of Australian soldiers who might have otherwise remained unknown forever and that they have brought to life the stories of the women and families that they left behind. Again, we thank you for being here with us tonight and we thank Patrick for allowing us to make a small contribution to an important Australian story. Thank you, Mrs. McDiamond. Before we view the documentary, I would like to ask author, documentary, make, documentary filmmaker and mentor, Patrick Lindsay, to talk briefly about the documentary and his involvement with students over a period of almost three years. Thanks, Lily. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kerry, for all the kind words. Um, it seemed like a pretty foolproof plan when Mick and I first chatted. Uh, the girls would research their digger, and if possible, they'd meet their descendants and learn the impact of the death on that family. And then we'd go over to France and we'd literally walk in the footsteps of those diggers and we'd visit their graves and then we'd make a documentary through the eyes of the girls and looking at that experience and the war through the female point of view. We planned that and we planned how and when and who and why and we thought our biggest problem would be organising Lambus actually <laughs> but we didn't of course take into account a global pandemic but like all good planners, we, as they say today, we pivoted and we waited and we pivoted again and we waited and pivoted again until we realised that if we didn't continue and try to finish the film, then the kids would probably finish uni by the time we got it done. So we visited Framil via the magic of green screen 
Uh, we did interviews via Zoom, as everyone has been over COVID. And we also commissioned a wonderful drone pilot over in France to go and shoot aerials of the battlefield and the village. It became a passion project for all of us um, over those years. And I think we learned enormous lessons from it during that period. And of course, it started with the passion of our great friend Lambus. And without his magnificent obsession of finding the missing diggers of Fromel, then those 250-odd young diggers would still be languishing in muddy, unknown pits next to Pheasant Wood near the village of Fromel. And their families would have no idea of their ultimate fate, and nor would they have anywhere to go and visit them and pay their respects to them. And Lambus did all of that against the advice of the so-called experts who were telling him that there's no way in the world they could have missed 250 diggers, that he was a nutter and an obsessive and he should give it away. And there's such a great lesson to be learnt from following your heart the way that Lambus has. And I think Australia, so many families and us owe a great deal of thanks to Lambus and his passion. I thank you also to Mick Burden, a wonderful, passionate teacher, and to Antoinette and Kerry, two great principals who saw the value of the project immediately and followed it right through to its conclusion. And of course, all of you, all of the supporters, the girls' families, the diggers' families, Madame Bouillon and the French consulate and the French school and all of the kids involved there, the RSL clubs and all of our project funders, vital. I found with projects like these, there's always a turning point which determines whether it's going to go ahead or not. This one came when we were trying to raise funds for the production budget. Tiny little budget, but it was hard to get to it. And we're about halfway through when Lily Whittaker spoke and was interviewed on Alan Jones's radio program. And she spoke so beautifully that he invited her onto his TV program on Sky News. And I got a call straight after from Steve Shelley. And he said, I heard Lily and I want to help. How much do you need? How far behind are you? And I said, well, I'm not 100% sure. I'll find out and I'll ring you back. So I rang him back and I checked and I rang him back and I said, we're 18 grand short. And he said, 18's my favourite number. <laughs> Consider it done. Now, that's what I call the turning point. We knew then we could go and we could complete this project. Of course, we didn't know COVID, but we still knew and we had the confidence because of Steve and Kylie. So a sincere thank you to Steve and Kylie for their magnificent generosity and to Steve's parents, as we heard before, Josie and Arthur, for all their support and their passion to make sure that they honoured their missing digger, Herbert Nutsy Bolt, and you'll hear of Herbert in the doco. Finally, and most importantly in many ways, thank you to our girls. You rose above all the disappointments and the difficulties, and you persisted and you prevailed right through to the end. Mick and I haven't given up hope that maybe one day we can all walk together on the battlefields there in the footsteps of the diggers and finally complete that original dream. But if that day doesn't come to pass, then I hope that you'll all try individually to get over there and take that walk because I guarantee you it'll be something you will never forget. I've watched the girls, all of you, grow so much over these years. It's a wonderful period in a girl's life from year nine through to year 12. Um, and I wasn't at all surprised when Mick told me the other day that the girls are forming the base of the leadership team in this high school certificate year here at St Clair's. Didn't surprise me at all. And I've got no doubt that you girls will play major leadership roles in our country in the years ahead. I have no doubt about that. And God knows we need our women leaders to step up and be given the chance here. I'll be watching when you do that with great pride. In the meantime, I hope that you're proud of your work 
and that you're proud of our documentary. So thank you for the experience. Cheers. Thank you, Patrick, and thanks to all of all that you've done for us over the past three years. Well, now it is time to see the finished production. It is not exactly what we set out to produce, as Patrick said. When we started this journey, we anticipated following in the footsteps of the soldiers we've researched. We wanted to walk the ground they walked and see where they wrote their letters home to their families, to read the letters sent from home where they would have read them. Unfortunately, the world changed just a before we were due to leave for France, and so did our plans for finishing the documentary. Through some very creative thinking by Patrick, we were able to complete the project despite numerous obstacles, both physical and technical. We are very proud of what we have accomplished, and we hope that you enjoy the film. Through years of lonely vigil kept, to look for me, they never came. None ever searched or even wept. Nobody stayed to speak my name. Until that summer day I heard some voices soft and stained with tears. Then I knew they had come to roll away those wasted years. Their hearts felt out to hold me made me whole like other men, but they had come just me to see, drawing me back home with them. Now I am at peace and free to roam, where here my family speak my name. That day my soul was called back home, for on that day my family came. The scale of the First World War was astonishing. Some 65 million men took up arms and of those, 37.5 million were killed, wounded, missing or taken prisoner. This now beautiful street in famous Paddington, just three kilometres away from our school, was once a slum. Yet this did nothing to damper its patriotism. Bent Street here in 1916 was just 30 houses. And of these 30 houses, 29 men enlisted to serve in the Great War. Here on the streets in Paddington and all around the nation, everybody was behind the war. Pride painted the streets as nearly half of Australia's eligible men enlisted. Today, that's an equivalent to 2 million men volunteering to serve. 62,000 men died in the fighting, but this number significantly doubled within the next decade this was due to wounds, illness, and unfortunately, suicide. As part of their history studies, students from Sydney's St. Clair's College in Waverley created video profiles of missing diggers from the 1916 Battle of Fromelles in Northern France. Over more than two years, the project expanded into a documentary film to honour the diggers and to view the conflict through the eyes of the families and loved ones who sent their men halfway around the world and never saw them again. He wrote home to his mother and father, France is a beautiful place, a regular paradise after the burning sands and heat of the Egyptian desert. There is no reason whatever why I shouldn't go right through the ordeal and come back and see you all again. He was my grandfather's older brother and I've always just been really interested in him because my grand great-grandmother never really got over his death. He was supposed to be very talented and clever and just a really nice young man and 
the family never really got over his not knowing what happened to him. They hoped that he was had been kidnapped or captured and was alive somewhere, but they never really knew what happened to him. And even many years after the war, my great grandfather was still writing letters trying to find out what had happened to him. In 1915, at the age of 18, George was handed a white feather to symbolise cowardice while sitting in the church. This led to his enlistment into World War I on the 2nd of October. The story I was told by my grandfather is that when he was at church he was handed a white feather and um, I think there was a lot of pressure from some women that men should do their duty and join up and so I think he felt like it was his duty and if he didn't, he, people would think he was a coward. Yeah. He'd been such a bright, bright student. I, I think he was supposed to be, have been Ducks of Sydney Boys High um, and he'd been the first one to go to university in our family and my grandmother, she just really never got over the loss. Every year she'd put a little notice in the newspaper, that my great-grandmother it is, um, you know, remembering him. There's a lot of letters in the album, but this is the one that I find the most moving. It's the last letter that came from George before he went missing. So a letter from George to his mother on the 10th of July. We are now under fire from the enemy just behind the trenches, and so far there have been no casualties. The time has come at last when we must one and all face the enemy, and may God help us for the sake of those we have left behind, for I know you'll be most anxious, and I don't want you to worry. Dear Mother, keep praying and keep happy. It's no use being sad. There is too much sorrow in France. Your loving son, George. That puts a lump in my throat every time I read it. Yeah. And I feel like he's speaking to us from the grave. He's speaking for all young men everywhere that yeah. just sacrifice. The battle for Fromel illustrates Australia's first World War losses, perhaps more than any other. It happened near a tiny hamlet in northeastern France over just 24 hours on the 19th of July, 1916. When the First World War came to Fromel, it had a population of about 1,000 people living in 200 houses. The railway had arrived in 1902 and electricity finally reached the main street the year before war broke out. As with countless villages and towns across France, Fromel would be totally destroyed by war's end. By the time the Australian forces had reached France, following the disastrous Gallipoli campaign, the fighting on what had become known as the Western Front in France and Belgium had degenerated into a muddy, bloody stalemate with hundreds of lives being sacrificed for every metre of ground gained. The commanders from both sides faced an impossible problem because the front lines mirrored each other for 760 kilometres. Right across the continent, from the English Channel to the Swiss Alps, there were no edges or flanks. If you can't outflank your enemy, you must attack them head on. So, the conflict became a terrible war of attrition, as men and machinery were thrown against each other in ever-increasing numbers, and the casualties rose accordingly. In mid-1916, the Allies tried to break the deadlock by launching a massive assault around the Somme River, north of Paris. It ended as an unthinkable disaster. On the opening day of the battle alone, the 1st of July 1916, the British suffered 57,000 casualties, including 19,000 killed. To prevent the Germans from bringing reinforcements from northern France to the Somme, the Allies staged a diversionary attack a fake attack near the tiny village of Fromel. But as so often happens in the chaos of war, the planned fake attack somehow turned into a real one without giving the Australians any time for proper planning. And the catastrophe of Fromel was born. Although the Australians of the 5th Division only reached the area days before the battle, they were thrown against the long-established German defences in broad daylight on a fine summer's evening at 6pm on July 19, 1916. Around 7,000 diggers, half of whom had already survived Gallipoli, charged across this ground, as flat as football fields, with no cover at all, 
right into the teeth of the German machine guns. Here, on the right side of the Australian front line, no man's land was about 350 metres wide. The diggers had no chance. The Allies nicknamed this German position the sugar loaf because it resembled a local loaf of bread. This was the deadliest place in Fromel because it was full of machine gun nests. On the other side of the Australian front line, no man's land was less than 100 metres wide and it was here that the diggers broke through the German front lines. Sadly, many of them died there when the Germans counter-attacked and most of them disappeared without trace for almost a century. They became the lost diggers of Fromel. During the nights and days after the battle, more diggers heroically lost their lives trying to recover their wounded and dead mates from no man's land under continuous fire. As they added up the terrible casualty toll, the Australians realised that hundreds of their mates had simply disappeared off the face of the earth. Of the 7,000 diggers who attacked at Fromel, 5,533 became casualties, with almost 2,000 of those killed including 25 sets of brothers and a father and son, all within 24 hours. Indeed, we lost more killed in Fromel than we did in total in the Boer, Vietnam and Korean Wars and every conflict since. To this day, it is the worst 24 hours in our history. Australian diggers suffered proportionally more deaths, illnesses and wounds than the armies of Britain Germany, the US, Canada or France. The devastating losses from the war affected virtually every family in Australia. One in every four families lost a brother, a son or a husband. But in addition to the terrible losses, the story of Fromel differs from many of the better known battles from World War I because, more than a century after it occurred, it remains a living fragment of our history. Of the almost 2,000 Australian dead at Fromel, Around 1,300 were declared missing, and their families were thrust into a terrible netherworld, not knowing how their loved ones had died, or even whether they had died at all. Many mothers of the missing diggers left their veranda lights on for the rest of their lives, hoping that one day their sons would return home. That's why we began our project, to keep the memories of the missing diggers of Fromel alive, by creating lasting video portraits of them and looking at the impact that the battle and war in general had on the loved ones and the communities the diggers left behind. It's hard to imagine it. Death, the dirt, agony. It's an entirely different universe. You spend so much time preparing to go to war and go through blood, sweat and tears to make sure you know exactly what's coming, but nothing can prepare you for it. Edgar Williams worked for 60 hours after the 19th of July, bringing in wounded till he was sniped and blinded. We saw him but could not get at him. I saw him blown to pieces by a bomb in a German trench at Fromel on the morning of the 20th. Herbert's mother leaves a special plaque resting on the opposing side of her headstone, keeping her son's memory alive. Jack's mother, Isa, was known as a local poetess in her town. She wrote many poems and provided an emotional insight into how many families grieved death during the war. Cherished names in golden letters tell how heavy was the cost on the long and bitter conflict that a cause might not be lost. At thy shrine in sad remembrance, every heart will hope and pray that the peace so dearly purchased, peace at last for A. I am still waiting, first missing, then prisoner of war, then killed in action.
I know he was not the only by thousands, but he was my son. Just lent to me for 35 years and then missing. I know a good son. I believe a good man. But I do not know if a good soldier. He has paid the price, as many others have done. But in all the world, there is not love like a mother's love for her children. The family's grief and the lack of information about their loved ones continued for 90 years until a retired Melbourne art teacher, Lambus and Glazos, began a remarkable detective quest. As Lambus did his research on Fromel, he realised the numbers of those known to have gone missing from the battle and those listed as being buried in the local cemeteries didn't add up. There was that distinction to be made between missing and the unaccounted for missing. The numbers did not add up and we'd seen the photograph of soldiers stacked high on the carts of a light rail being taken back somewhere behind their lines of burial and we put forth the proposition that somewhere behind the German line there should be a burial site of our missing soldiers. Lambus and a growing team of supporters from Australia and overseas began a decade-long quest. They relentlessly gathered evidence that ultimately forced the reluctant authorities to search the area where they believed the Germans had buried the missing diggers behind a wood that the Germans had named Pheasant Wood. There was a German document found in 2006 which stated you will dig before Pheasant Wood for 400. So there was no more evasive smoke. The ground had been used for burial purposes. We found a series of aerial photographs of that ground and before the battle, no digging. Then 10 days after the battle, clear evidence of sustained earthwork. Eventually, the experts not only found the missing diggers just where Lambus and his team said they would be, but they were able to exhume the remains and start identifying them using DNA. I was invited on site one time to view those remains. It was very graphic and clearly they were not at rest. I believe you have that moral obligation to find and recover your war dead. You cannot leave them in anonymous dirt. Today, two thirds of the 250 missing diggers discovered by Lambus and Glazers and his team in 2008 have been identified by DNA matching. And each year, more of them are identified and given headstones where their long suffering families can visit them and pay their respects. Identifying one was wonderful, but 166 is sensational. And that process will continue. There's a lot of symbolism in this room. In a way, the power of people's uh, memories for the people they love, the people they lost, the reason that this place stands today. The history of war is usually written by men, but women bear the brunt of grieving that follows every conflict. We came here today to bring a feminine viewpoint to the impact of these battles and to give a voice to the families who lost so much. Did your mother ever tell you anything about Nazi? No, nothing. Sadly, she didn't know anything about her father. We all grew up living next door to Jenny mm -hmm. and didn't know that she had remarried and so we thought her husband was our grandfather. Oh. So it wasn't until much later in life that we found out that he actually wasn't, that our real grandfather had been killed in the war. One of the young diggers who disappeared in the battle was a well-known Sydney Rugby League footballer named Herbert Bolt. Known as Nazi Bolt, he played twice for New South Wales and seemed destined for a glittering career. After attending Newtown Public School, his career as a rugby player kicked off and his love for the game was definitely shown in his 52 games, triumph against Queensland twice 
all achieved through his dedication between 1912 and 1915. Herbert also married Jenny Hughes, and together they moved to southern Sydney, where they started a family, welcoming a baby girl, Mary Monica, whom Herbert called Little Mona. If ever a husband you should have, and he this book should see, tell him of our youthful days and kiss him once for me. I think that reality had hit and probably realised that he was in fact going to a deep dark war and wasn't coming home. I'm reading into that that he truly loved his wife and wanted her to be happy and was probably suggesting that if she ever did meet somebody else and was to move on, he wanted her to enjoy her life and um, at least think of him from time to time. Before this all happened, I had little or no interest at all. Never even gave my great-grandfather a, a second thought. And, uh, and, and I've actually asked that question of a lot of people. Do you even know the name of your great-grandfather? And most people say no. Pretty amazing thing to have been able to build a connection with somebody who passed away such a long time ago. It was a, a wonderful experience to be involved in everything that happened around Fromel. On the morning of the 20th of July at about 5am at Flaubert, he and I were close to one another when we were attacked by the Germans. He got more than six of them with his bayonet and the butt of his rifle when he got a bullet through his head. He fell instantly, being killed outright. He was as game as any man and was a well-known Newtown football player. Well, this is Herbert Nutsibolt. This is uh, my great-grandfather and my mother's grandfather. Um, and this is a, a shrine, if you like, our, our reincarnation, so we can pay our respects, which we, we do quite regularly, especially at Anzac Days and, and the anniversary of the 20th of July. How does it feel for both of you having a sense of him always here with you? Well, for myself, I love it. I think it's just beautiful. And each time I come in and see him, I get quite emotional and rather full of goosebumps. Mm. It's just beautiful. I love it. it to me, it, it gives um, a real purpose to the home because yeah. if, if it wasn't for Nazi, if Nazi never existed, neither would we, including my mum and myself. So, um, you know, we, we do have a hell of a debt of gratitude to our great grandfather, and it was a small token of our appreciation to try and let his memory live on. One of the missing diggers would play a key role in confirming that the diggers were still buried in the mass graves where the Germans had left them almost a century earlier. His name was Harry Willis and his great nephew Tim Whitford, a former soldier himself, became a leading member of Lambus and Glazers' team of history detectives. I was brought up in the care of my grandmother and my beautiful grandmother, she, she was a big part of my life and I, I adored her. And I remember one day, um, Nan asked me what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I said, Nan, I want to be a soldier, I want to be an army man. And the colour just drained out of her face straight away. She said, don't you dare, don't you bloody dare. If you join the army, you'll get killed, you'll, be, you'll disappear like, like my Uncle Harry. He went off to war and he disappeared. And, that moment in that kitchen in Yarram, I'll never ever forget. Growing up, you know, you, you understood that people could just disappear and, and it left a scar, you know, and my, my grandmother carried, carried that with her for her whole life. In the 2007 um, non-invasive survey, they found hundreds and hundreds of, of metallic objects. Most of them were just First World War junk, shrapnel balls, bullets, um, shell fragments. You'd find that anywhere around from them. But among those objects, they found two medallions. Through uh, meticulous research, all of a sudden, the, the owner of that medallion is revealed, and it's and it's Private Harry Willis from Alberton in South Gippsland, Victoria, my, my, my grandmother's uncle. And um, it... it it hit me like a ton of bricks. In 2008, um, I was I was there at the site. After two days, they found nothing. They dug and they dug and they dug, and there's speculation, but nothing. Then on the on the third day, they found the first of the diggers, and uh, 
and, and, and this overwhelming sense of um, vindication, I guess, and but uh, sadness washed over me. You know, we have left these guys there for 92 years at that stage. We'd left them in a paddock for 92 years and we didn't have to. And, uh, I, you know, I, I freely admit I, I wept. So what have we learned about the cost of war and the long-term damage that it causes? The Battle of Fromel devastated families right across Australia. Lamps were lit and left in windows, places set at dinner tables. The effect of the Battle of Fromel was devastating to families. The anxiety, the loss and the grief through the work of uh, St Clair's, uh, the future of commemoration and remembrance is assured and in useful hands. And I think after doing this assignment, it's made us realise that the history is real. Like we've we've met family members of these soldiers, we've heard their stories, and like we've got like real like letters and stuff. It just shows how much more personal and like the the deeper experience that they've got, and that we don't get from just reading from textbooks. It sort of made it all very personal because we weren't just looking at numbers; we were actually looking at a person's life, like their family, their what they were doing before they went to the war made it very, yeah, a lot more sad. Um, of course I knew like a little bit about World War I, but I, like everyone else said, I didn't know anything about the Battle of Fromel and just how many people died and how it was one of the worst nights in Australia's history, yet we don't even learn about it in school. I really want us to spread the message that we should remember all these soldiers, not just on Anzac Day, but every day we should be thinking about the big impact they had on Australian history. Um, so that's what I really want us to try and achieve with this project. It's just weird. It's like you know them like it's like a friend that like you just know but have never seen. Um, it's very strange. <laughs> this like project really made me think about <clears throat> um, like how war has so many effects and like all these young men we're going to war thinking, like, this is going to be the greatest adventure, like, we're going to do this all together. And really, it wasn't that, and they had no idea about that. Now, after doing this for almost two years, it's just put into perspective, like, how important each life is and how much of an impact one person can make on other people. I've always thought, like, war tragic is important. It's an important part of history. It helps us to, like, learn more about previous times and learn more about society and Fromel has just more opened my eyes I think a bit more to like the personal side of it and how um, families were affected and how Australia was affected by the war. It's so unfair it was just it's so unfair that he had to die and he was just he was so young he was 17 and I just want to be able to kind of I don't really know the words. I just want to be able to like keep his story and the story of other people who died in the Battle of Fromel to continue like through generations. Like I want my kids to learn about this and everyone to learn about it because it's so important.
We hope you enjoyed the documentary. It is something we're all very proud of, and we hope to be able to share it across numerous platforms so as many people as possible can learn about the impact of Fromel and how family and how and on fa had on families right across the nation. I would like to invite Mr. Burden and Lambus Inglesos to take a special presentation to each of the students involved in the project. Just before we um, we head out for some supper, just uh, in the same place we had beautiful uh, canapes, uh, we've got a special presentation to each of the girls. You would have seen throughout the documentary, the girls have badges lined up and down their blazers. Those badges are given for doing extra things, extra things around the school. And it's no surprise when you look at the girls that so many of them have badges because they're just so, so brilliant. So um, if the girls would come up in this order, and I know some of you, just in case you haven't uh, had the chance to meet some of the girls, some of the relatives, so I'll just highlight the soldiers that they, they focused on. So uh, Imi Barham, Lily Garrett, and Kate O'Sullivan. They started their journey profiling uh, Thomas Gainsborough Clark. Kate also took on the profile of Herbert Bolt, while Imi and Lily dedicated time to researching John Forrest. So across the, the group, the girls often did two or three profiles as the project developed. Emily Kropp, good job guys. So M took on uh, Alec, uh, Ellen Mitchell in 2018. She was unable to find any descendants, so because of the project, we were looking for soldiers that we, we could build uh, connections with. Uh, M moved on to Alex Klingen and did some research on Alex and uh, completed the profile of Alex. And while doing that, we realised that Alex Klingen and uh, Herbert Bolt were um, possibly known to each other before they, um, they headed off to war. Both lived in Newtown and uh, we heard a few weeks ago that um, Alex played for Newtown as well. So there's a lot of strange coincidences throughout this journey that we, we're not sure why those, uh, those things occur. Emma Fitzgerald, Ayla Rizza and Elena Regg. They started a uh, profiled Herbert Haslam. <laughs> and, and during uh, their research, Herbert was the only, only soldier we could not find uh, an image of. And when we met um, Leonie and her family, they, they informed us that there was no photo, that none of the family members had ever seen a photo of Herbert. So that's why on the, um, on the, the documentary you saw the headstone and not a picture. Um, Ayla and Elena also took on the profile of George Duncan and had the, the pleasure of spending time with Jane, as you saw on the documentary. Uh, George was a very special case to us in particular because he lived down in Newland Street which is down near Queen's Park and um, he was a Waverley boy. Bailey Hill and Lily Simos profiled Thomas Sheridan. <laughs> and once again in 2018 they started with Thomas Sheridan and once again had uh, we couldn't identify any uh, relatives, so they moved on to Harold Cutting and we built a, a connection with um, Nancy McLaughlin and we were desperate to get down and talk to Nancy uh, last year, but COVID, she's in a nursing home at Oran Park, so we couldn't get down to see her. She had some great stories about uh, her visit to Fromel and uh, we hope that we can get down to see her at some point. Natalia Ray and Thea Zamet. The girls profiled uh, Benedict Dunstan, and that was one soldier that we had lots of contacts for, and we didn't have to uh, go to another soldier for those girls. Hannah Simos and Claudia Van Dam. <laughs> the girls profiled Harold Woodman in 2018, and then went on to create a profile of John Joseph Goulding, who you saw. And Claudia also took on a profile of, of Edgar Williams and it was wonderful tonight that um, 
Claudia was able to meet uh, Graham and uh, Jan, who have come down from Queensland, especially for tonight. So we're really delighted that uh, they're able to be with us tonight. So thanks for making the effort, guys. It's terrific. Thank you. <laughs> and there's one more, one more person to go, and that is Lily Whitaker, our famous media <laughs> genius. One, just one, just one spin. Lily uh, was the star of the show last year on the Alan Jones show and was um, responsible for, for us getting quite, um, what's it? <laughs> quite a lot of publicity through her brilliant performance, uh, both on the radio and uh, on TV. And um, Lily has also been blessed to have uh, been able to spend time with, uh, with Annette Tebb and Annette, uh, direct descendant of Ernest Gench. So Ernest was Lily's soldier. So... These are the girls who have stuck with it over three years and while we very, very disappointed that we didn't um, get to France and it's not exactly what we wanted, I think uh, you'll all agree they've done a great job and um, with Patrick as their mentor, they can be very proud of what they've achieved. So uh, one more round of applause for what well, other great effort, guys. <laughs> All right, so I'll just ask uh, Lily to conclude proceedings and she'll let you know what's happening with supper. And a special thank you to the National Treasure, Lemus and Glazos. No, you're not talking. You're not talking. No, you can if you want. Um, Lambus is looking much better, much younger than he did in the documentary, I must say. So, <laughs> COVID, COVID, COVID. COVID. Yeah, a lot of bad things happened in COVID. But anyway, he's, it's, he's looking much better. So do you want to say something? Okay, all right. all right. And then when you finish, Lily, we'll have it. Uh, it's been a remarkable journey with uh, a team effort and a wonderful result. But at this point, I'd like to have a word maybe to the, to the parents. You might want to put your fingers in your ears and go la, 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 la. But I mean, uh, next time uh, to the students, your parents ask you what do you want for your birthday, dear. You could tell them uh, I'd like $5,000 on a trip to France. <laughs> Good luck with that. If you can get away with it, you let me know because I can provide you with a map of some very likely places to dig. But if that doesn't happen, um, with uh, your studies and your ongoing studies, all the best with those, uh, a, a good job, and uh, make your own pilgrimage in your own time, Lee. You go there and you walk the ground. You've advanced the soldiers' stories and hopefully the time will come when you get to make that pilgrimage to walk the ground and to greet your soldier. Well done, St Clairs. Once again, we would like to thank all of you for coming along this evening to share in our journey. Your support has enabled, us, has enabled this project to come to life. Particularly, we would also like to give another thank you to Mr. Burden, and we would also like to give you a small token of our gratitude with um, these gifts. So could you please come up, Mr. Burden? <laughs> Thank you and please join us outside for some su supper. Have a good evening everyone. <laughs>